I used to work really hard, but all I got were average results. For the longest, I used to think, yeah, this was my limit. I couldn't get any better. But then I got a wake up call. I realized my mistakes, I made some changes, and I finished top 10 at Cambridge University. So if you're cruising along on average, thinking this is your limit, watch till the end of the video, start making these changes, and start breaking your limits. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name's Shane and I'm a recently qualified doctor and neuroscience supervisor at Cambridge University. And today I wanna to talk about two mistakes that I was making that was holding me back and kept me at average. I'm gonna talk about five changes that I made that helped me grow from average to actually finishing top 10 at Cambridge University. And you know what? At the end of it all, after I made these changes, I probably worked less than I actually did before. In fact, at the end, I'll talk about some rapid memorization techniques that have helped me memorize memorize a lot of things in a very small space of time. And as always, you can find everything that I'm gonna talk about in the timestamps below, and you can jump to whatever section that you're most interested in. So let me begin by talking about the two mistakes that I was making that was actually holding me back and keeping me at this average level. And to do this, I actually want to start back at GCSE A-level kind of time. During that time, the way that I'd actually learn and understand things was to sit down with a textbook and just make notes on it. And to be honest, all I did was look at the textbook, copy down the actual points it was making without any of the connecting words. At the actual time of doing that, I wasn't really paying attention to what I was reading. I was literally just converting what was in the textbook into my own written form, in a bullet pointed form. And after I'd do this, I'd actually reread the notes and then go over it over and over again. And to be honest, that worked pretty well for a while. I did quite reasonably at GCSE and A-level. So I bet you're thinking, cool, so the secret is make notes and reread it. Well, that's what I thought too. So when I got to university, I just thought, you know what? I'll just make my own notes based on all the lecture material I was being given, and then that will lead to learning and understanding because it worked at GCSE and A-level, so why shouldn't it work now? So that's exactly what I did. I spent the first term just looking at the lecture material and just noting down every single thing, every single sentence that was being said in my own bullet-pointed form. But like I said, when I was actually doing that, I wasn't actually paying attention. I wasn't actually taking things in, into my mind. I was literally just writing things out onto another piece of paper from another piece of paper. And the funny thing is, I actually understood that at, at the time. I caught myself being like, you know what, I'm actually not understanding or learning the thing. But because I was like, you know what, this worked at GCSE at A level, let me just keep doing it, trust the process. And I also thought, you know what, I have Christmas holidays, I can just read the thing during the holidays, learn it and memorize it after just one time of reading. Thinking that the key to learning and understanding was note making and rereading was the biggest thing that held me back at university. Thinking that I could read, learn, understand and memorize everything in just one Christmas holiday was my second biggest mistake. Anyway, come Christmas holidays, I still hadn't finished the notes that I wanted to make, so I actually spent the first few weeks catching up on the notes and finishing things off, and then only I started the phase of actually reading something and learning and understanding. But obviously it was quite tight for time. I barely managed to read everything just once by the end of the holidays. And obviously that wasn't enough time to shift things into my long-term memory. So come my first set of exams at the beginning of January, I flopped them quite badly, despite having worked super hard throughout the term, making all of these notes, and then working super hard during the Christmas holidays, finishing the notes, and actually trying to learn and understand things. And I remember spending the first few weeks after finding my results in January, just thinking, you know what? Maybe this is me. This is where I've peaked. This is my maximum. I can't actually do any better than this. And I remember speaking to one of my supervisors about this, and he looked at me and he said, why are you making notes? Why don't you just read the material? And that was the biggest turning point for me throughout my whole time at university. It wasn't so much the notion of stop making notes and start reading that actually got through to me, but it was the concept that actually it wasn't me. The problem wasn't to do with me inherently. Instead, this idea of the problem is to do with the way I was going about learning, understanding and memorizing things. And that was really revolutionary it really gave me the confidence to actually do away with all these past tactics that had worked for me at GCSEs and A-levels and actually start implementing some changes and seeing what impact that would have. So that brings me on to the five changes that I ended up making. The first set of changes refers to the way I went about learning and understanding the lecture material. The second set of changes refers to how I went about memorizing the content. 
So the first change that I made was stopped copying out notes. Instead, the way I'd prepare for a lecture was to pre-read. So what do I mean by pre-read? Essentially, I'd set out a block of time the day before when a lecture was meant to happen. And I'd sit there and read the whole lecture. Not making any notes, but just reading it and taking things in. Now, this helped me in two ways. One, it helped me gain the big picture. And two, it helped me understand what I didn't know. So in terms of getting the big picture, I found that reading the lecture before the actual lecture was being delivered allowed me to connect the individual topics within that lecture by myself. I was able to take this big picture view, connect the ideas all together right before I actually went to the lecture. In the sense, I already had a framework built up in my mind in terms of how things were gonna go within that lecture. And it also gave me some time to look at an even bigger picture and see how that lecture fitted in with the overall topic that we were doing at the time. So taking this big picture view of things, actually I later found out this is something called concept mapping and there's a solid evidence base supporting how useful this is in contributing to learning and understanding material. So the second thing that pre-reading helped me was in terms of understanding what I didn't know. So essentially when I was reading the material, Often I'd come across a concept or an idea that I just didn't know what it was. Or it might even be a word that I actually, you know what, I don't know what this means. And I'd force myself, whenever that happened, to actually look it up straight away. I'd Google it, use Wikipedia, whatever, to find a good description or an explanation to that idea that I wasn't quite familiar with. Then I'd settle on a pretty good description or an explanation that helped me understand it at the time. And importantly, I'd write it down right next to where that idea or concept is mentioned in the lecture note. Doing this saved me a lot of time in the future because I didn't have to go back and research things all over again. Now, of course, there were times that actually a Google search or a Wikipedia search actually never found the real answer for me. Whenever this happened, I'd note down with a little star or an asterisk next to where that idea or concept is mentioned within the lecture handout. This was like a trigger for me to know that this idea or concept I don't know know and I can't figure it out by myself independently. This would set me up to actually pay more attention to things later on when the actual lecture was happening. But it also gave me a cue to realize this is a topic that I don't know and I should ask other people about, either my supervisor or the actual lecturer when he's done with the lecture. So I found that pre-reading gave me this big picture view of things, but it also helped me to realize what I didn't know and it motivated me to actually go about figuring things out myself independently at the first port of call and then in the second port of call when that failed to actually go and ask other people to find out more information about it. And I found that doing this in advance of the actual lecture gave me enough time to process things to actually go and ask the lecturer a meaningful question to figure out what that idea or concept actually meant. Right, so the second change that I made was something called active presence. I often found that whenever I went to a lecture I'd zone out like all of the time. And if I hadn't pre-read something, or if it was the first time I was encountering something, then I'd have no context or point of reference. So, I mean, I'd zone out, I'd try to zone back in, and then not realize what the hell the lecture was talking about, and I'd just zone back out again. So basically, it was a vicious cycle, and it wasn't working. So I found that I had to practice this degree of active presence, which is essentially a state where you're maximally alert to note down any good explanation or description whenever the lecturer says it. Now this sounds a little bit philosophical, but bear with me. The important point to actually realize is that this active presence where you're maximally alert doesn't exist for the whole period of the lecture. Because let's be honest, that's not realistic. You know, you, no one can be that alert for all of the time. You're gonna be zoning out and you're gonna be zoning back in and that's just how things are. But active presence allows you to be maximally alert at that specific point where you know that you don't understand something and the information that's going to be given by the lecturer is going to be maximally useful. So I was actually able to use this tactic because of the fact that I had pre-read and I'd already noted down the concepts and ideas that I wasn't sure about. And also mentally note the actual topic or point that came right before the idea that I wasn't sure about. So whenever the lecturer would be talking about that, even if I was kind of zoned out, I'd hear it just kind of vaguely and it will be a cue for me to zone back in because I know something that's going to be really important is going to be said now. So by doing this, I actually found the lecture and the whole experience to be much more enjoyable because I was able to cut myself a lot of slack. It was okay if I zoned out because I'd already pre-read and set these pre-triggers that meant that I'm going to zone back in at the exact optimal point that I can take the maximal amount of useful information about the topic that I wasn't sure about. 
The third change that I made was post-read. Immediately after the lecture, I'd allocate some time for me to consolidate everything that was said in the lecture as well as the lecture material itself. Now, this doesn't mean just reread the notes with all the annotations and stuff that you've made. Instead, it refers to two things that I did. One was chunking and the other is active retrieval. So chunking refers to breaking down this big lecture into its different subtopics and categories. Often that'll be done for me because it'll be split into different subheadings and different subsections by the lecturer themselves. Then I'd carry out a process of active retrieval within each subsection. So I'll explain how exactly I'd do that. Say I had a lecture handout or a lecture material in front of me. I'd read the subheading and then I'd cover whatever text was underneath it, or I'd look away. Then I'll carry out a process of active retrieval based on the trigger that was the subheading. And I'd rack my mind to come up with as many points as possible within that subheading and subsection. After I'd squeezed as much as possible, I'd actually go and read that section to make sure that I've got at least 90% of the points from that paragraph or subsection. If I hadn't, I'd then do the process again until the point that I had got more than 90% of the points within that subsection. Once I got to that threshold, I then moved on and repeated the whole process again for the next chunk or next subsection. So this process of chunking and active retrieval massively helped my learning and understanding. Obviously at the time I did this because it was intuitive to me and I didn't really know the research behind it. But obviously now we know that chunking and active retrieval are two very powerful psychological and evidence-based tools to help us actually learn and understand material. So I turned this post-reading and consolidation my second pass. The first time I actually read something, I termed that the first pass. So I'd done the first pass when I pre-read something and I did my second pass when I did my post-reading and I found that those two things together were fundamental in developing my learning and understanding of that topic. But this second pass, not only did it consolidate the material, but it also set me on this journey of memorization, which is exactly what we're gonna be talking about next. So like I mentioned at the beginning, the second set of changes that I made was to do with memorization. And in terms of memorization, the first change that I made was something called the weekend review. So this was actually my third pass of carrying out chunking and active retrieval. But I'd make sure that my third pass was at least a day after my second pass. Essentially, this was my intuitive way of doing spaced repetition. I was allowing enough time for maybe things to get displaced and for things to be forgotten. And then I'd make sure to improve retention by actually going through the material using active retrieval and chunking again and actually act as a boost to my memory and like I mentioned I tried to do this at least a day after the last time I encountered it and then I'd always try to do it within that week before the next week begins. To be honest if I was doing this properly I should have actually spaced it out more in the sense that I maybe encountered it a week after now. At the time I wasn't fully aware of the science and you know what there was just so many new material and new content that had to be learnt and understood that I just didn't have the time and I went towards prioritizing the new material and learning things and keeping current more than actually strictly practicing this spaced repetition and if I had to do it again I'd probably do the same because it is very important to keep current, keep learning and understanding. But anyway, I felt this first pass pre-reading, second pass post-reading and third pass weekend review together help me learn, understand and memorize things quite well, even within the first week of getting hold of that ideas, concepts and lecture for the first time. Now, let me talk about my rapid memorization techniques that help me remember a lot of things with pretty much very little work and very little time spent. The first technique is story creation. And this is what I mean by it, and, I, and bear with me here. Essentially, what I do was create really weird, crazy stories that help me remember a lot of interconnected points. The way I do this is essentially I'd have this main character and they'll go about this super crazy, weird day where they'd experience weird things and meet new characters and each new character and weird thing would be associated with a particular condition or whatever thing that I had to remember, either through an idea association or a sound association. Now, again, bear with me and I'll give you an actual example to help you understand what I mean by this. So the example that I'm gonna use is the story that I made to remember the acute causes of shortness of breath. So in my story, there was a main character called Asthmatic Andy 
And he was essentially based on someone I knew who was called Andy and he actually had asthma. And he'd go through this crazy day, weird things would happen, new characters would come. So one of the acute causes of shortness of breath is something called anaphylaxis and essentially that just means allergic reaction. So I remembered that using a idea association and this is what I mean by it. So as an example of idea association, the B that you should hopefully be able to see now, that's associated with, with giving allergic reactions. So I use that to essentially in the story, asthmatic Andy is walking along, whatever, whatever, and then he gets bit by a bee. And the idea is I know that bees call anaphylaxis reactions and therefore it triggered me to think, okay, anaphylaxis. And then as an example of a sound association, hopefully you should see a part of the story where the superhero Flash has been called and Flash helped me to think of Flash pulmonary edema and therefore I was able to remember another cause of acute shortness of breath. So essentially I'd have this weird story that would have the main character progressing through the day and I felt that I could learn the story quite well because you know it was, it was super crazy and it was based on people that I knew and it was based on weird events that I could hold in my mind and because of the fact that I had these idea associations and sound associations in place it helped me pin it to the different conditions associated with shortness of breath. So basically I could go from not being able to hold all the different types of conditions that can cause shortness of breath in my mind to actually knowing all of them really well and almost in order of what could be the most common to what could be the least common by using this story formula because the stuff that would happen quite early on are the things that are more common and the stuff that would happen much later on were things that were less common so when I had to remember things in order I'd always just make stories and that worked fantastically. Another thing that I used for rapid memorization were mnemonics and the way I'd use mnemonics is that I'd make my own. I felt like the ones that I could make up, I remembered more and I'd always try my best to make it sound out. Like I always try to associate it with the thing that I'm trying to remember. For example, there was a set of questions that you need to ask someone when they come in with chest pain. And the mnemonic I used to remember those questions was POPSAC. I used POPSAC because when I think of chest pain, I think of a hot problem and POPSAC helped me to think of something like a sack or the hot that pops which then causes chest pain. Again, it's, so, it's something that's super silly and super weird, but that's the point. The weirder it is and the sillier it was, I felt like better I could remember it. So Popsack actually stood for palpitations, orthopnea, which is when you get short, short of breath, lying flat, and then PND or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, which is when you wake up short of breath. Then S was shortness of breath, and A was ankle edema, and C was chest pain. So I found using these mnemonics were again a very powerful, quick, easy way for me to remember a lot of things very quickly with very little effort put on my part. But the important thing that I'm trying to stress here is these are rapid memorization techniques to do after you've learnt and understood some things. For example, there's no point in being able to memorize all the different causes of shortness of breath if you don't actually understand what each of those things are. Obviously, to understand those things, I used all the techniques that I spoke about previously, so things like pre-reading and allowing me to concept map, and things within post-reading like active retrieval, chunking, and spaced repetition. So it's very important to nail that first and then start using these rapid memorization techniques to save yourself a lot of time. Now I know, making all of these changes all at once may seem very overwhelming and actually may feel like a big drain on your overall happiness but actually it really doesn't have to be and in the long term you'll actually be a lot happier and a lot more grateful towards yourself that you made these changes and if you're worried that you won't have enough time to implement these changes then definitely check out this video where I talk about how we can maximize our time and our happiness using some clever techniques and if you want to find out more about learning understanding and memorization and start using some more evidence-based techniques then you can check out my friend Ali's amazing Skillshare class and you can find a free link to that down below and I wish you the best of luck in your journey of making changes and seeing real results but that's it for me for today and I'll see you guys next time